Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the WIDA video blog studio. We always knew we'd have a third video blog on the WTO director general race, but even before we get to today's discussion, I think we can say with some certainty that we'll probably also have a fourth. Um, of course, this series of video blogs follows WIDA's interviews with all eight of the candidates to be WTO director general, including the two finalists, uh, Yu Myung Hee of Korea and Ngozi Okonjo Iweila of Nigeria. Welcome back today to Terry Stewart, one of Washington's leading trade lawyers and author of the blog, Current Thoughts on Trade. Wendy Cutler, Vice President and Managing Director of the Washington DC Office of the Asia Society Policy Institute and the former Acting Deputy US Trade Representative. And Ambassador Rufus Yerksa, President of the National Foreign Trade Council and a former Deputy Director General of the WTO. Welcome Terry, Wendy and Rufus back to the video blog studio. We learned today that Dr. Ngozi is the preferred candidate of most of the WTO members, but importantly, not one, the United States, who continues to back Minister Yu of South Korea. Um, she has also not withdrawn her candidacy, even though the general counsel has indicated that Dr. Ngozi has the most support. So starting with you, Rufus, you want to just uh, tell us where we are and, and how we got here? Yeah, thank you, Ken, and it's great to be back with you. The, the WTO has its troika working on this, but you've got your quartet, so this is, uh, I'm glad to be back with you all, and uh, we'll try to make some good music together. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously, um, I had said in the prior sessions that it was really the final round where the rubber meets the road, uh, and we're seeing just how tortuous the path is to getting a final consensus on an agreed candidate. So just stepping back a minute and taking stock of what happened, um, you know, obviously they had the last round. Uh, there was more support for Ngozi than for you by a considerable margin from what insiders tell me that there was much more significant support. There were a number of countries supporting use can candidacy, but the Troika decided to announce uh, that Negoci was the one most likely to achieve consensus. Um, but of course, when they held the open session, the U.S. indicated it was not prepared to support Ngozi, criticized the process. Um, they obviously must have said this to the Troika during the confessional that they had objections to Ngozi. Uh, but there's a lot of recriminations going on internally about why this wasn't clear earlier on in the process and had the U.S. sort of um, sprung a trap on, on people by not really making it clear that um, they would block earlier on. Uh, there's also, you know, it was a very interesting session, apparently, because not only did the U.S. announce that it was prepared to block Negoci, um, but it also was the U.S. that announced that Korea was not withdrawing its candidate, that the Korean candidate would remain in the race, and the Koreans remained silent. In other words, they declined to withdraw her candidacy, but they didn't state anything affirmatively in the meeting. Um, and that caused a, a, quite a furor in the discussions. In fact, a lot of countries, even some of the ones that had supported you um, were, were somewhat critical of, of the US approach to this. And it was, it was only the US that stated it was prepared to block. Now, why is, you know, the speculation, of course, among everybody is why is Light Hazard doing this? And is this uh, strategic or tactical? And, you know, we all know that uh, he has been prepared all along to block all kinds of things in the WTO system if he doesn't think they serve U.S. interests. So I don't see that changing very much right now. The, the other question, obviously, a lot of people are asking is why did this um, decision have to be announced and made now? Uh, a week before the U.S. election at a time of probably maximum likelihood that a Trump administration would be difficult on, on this in Geneva. And, you know, would it have been different if this had been kept under wraps until after the election? I think now going forward, nobody's really sure what the next steps are because you don't have a clear decision-making apparatus that says, okay, when we have a, a failure to have consensus, you know, we follow these procedures. It, a vote is not automatic. In fact, it takes a consensus of the members to really proceed to a vote. 
That's the way the voting process works. So the U.S. is unlikely to agree to even proceed to a vote. Uh, but, you know, I think the most likely scenario now, and we can talk about this, would be, um, you know, the, the Troika and the rest of the membership will have to uh, uh, take stock of the situation, wait and see what happens in the U.S. election. Uh, what happens if um, Bob Lighthizer is a lame duck USTR next week versus a USTR in a reelected Trump administration? And those are two very different scenarios. Uh, and uh, I don't think that it's realistic to think that it could be decided before people know that outcome. In fact, you know, there is the possibility, and we can talk about this, that it, we have a longer delay than that until a Biden administration is actually in office. People would immediately say, well, isn't that going to be terrible for the WTO? But if you think about it, what decisions are really going to be made in the WTO between now and a new a new administration, if it is a transition in the US, what decisions of any significance are really gonna be made? Probably very few. I'll stop there, Ken, and uh, see where you wanna take it. Ken, are you there? We seem to have lost Ken. Uh, should I uh, proceed since he was going to ask me um, about the support that Ngozi apparently had? We're, we're down to a troika here. Terry, go ahead. Okay. okay. Well, uh, the, the expectation uh, that I had was that after the United States, I mean, after Europe came out in support of Ngozi, that uh, we would be up over 100 uh, of the 164, my guess is a lot more than 100 uh, countries that had, or members who would come out in support of her uh, candidacy. Uh, the uh, Nigerians had uh, announced that the African Union had come out in, in uh, support, whether all the countries uh, within the African Union that are WTO members supported her. Uh, not exactly clear, but one would think that that would have been the case. Europe obviously added 27. Uh, and they had identified that they had an additional 27 uh, from the Americas and from uh, from Asia. Japan came out with a uh, with an announcement that the, that uh, they were going to be supporting Ngozi and, and not uh, Minister Yu. Uh, and um, uh, certainly, the press out of China this morning indicated that China had supported her uh, Ngozi as well. So they had a lot of uh, she had a lot of big names. Uh, uh, and big countries behind her, uh, and uh, clearly would have had uh, the broadest uh, support uh, geographically, uh, and obviously uh, in terms of types of members, least developed, developing and developed countries. So it, it's not surprising that the uh, that the announcement that Ambassador Walker made uh, was that she had received the most votes or preferences, and that she was a candidate most likely. Uh, to uh, to attract consensus going forward. I think the setting of the uh, general council uh, based on the U.S.'s actions yesterday on November 9th is to exactly to give them both time to huddle as to what to do, but also to see what the outcome uh, of the election is, uh, which hopefully they will know uh, by the time of the uh, general council meeting on the 9th. So why don't I, uh, why don't I stop there? So Rufus, I think there, there were a lot of questions about why the U.S. blocked Ngozi. Um, and um, yesterday evening, USTR put out a statement which didn't talk about Ngozi, but talked about why they supported Minister Yu. And it really honed in on her trade experience um, and her um, ability her experience of not only in trade negotiations, but in trade policy. And I think all of this was just a contrast, her, her skill set, her background with Ngozi. But that said, um, it's hard to um, conclude that that's what motivated the US here. Um, my sense is that, frankly, a lot of this reflected concerns um, that the US and specifically Ambassador Lighthizer has with Ngozi. Um, and whether that is due to perhaps her 
um, her experience in the World Bank and being more of a globalist or not really knowing how she'll come out on developing country issues, or frankly, the support she's gotten from certain former US and European trade officials, we don't really know. Um, but I think, I think what motivated the US was more than just their strong support for you. I think it was serious doubts and concerns about Ngozi. And maybe I can just continue. I think Korea is in a really tough spot here. I mean, I didn't realize, Rufus, what you just said, that Korea didn't even put up their flag during you know, this discussion um, yesterday in the Hans meeting. I mean, I'm sure Korea is under a lot of pressure from many countries to withdraw from the process. I suspect the US is putting pressure on Korea to stay in the process. So I wouldn't wanna be in Minister Yu's shoes now, but um, I would just conclude and say she's extremely smart, capable, um, and the fact that she rose from really being kind of an unknown in this race to being one of the, the finalists is a real testament to her, um, to her stature and her experience and her ability to convince a lot of members that she was a very serious candidate. Uh, welcome to myself back. Um, I don't know what happened. I've switched devices. Um, so apologies for my uh, uh, stepping out, but it seems like you guys proceeded with the uh, questions I had teed up for you guys before I left. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, where I was going to pick up here, I thought was, you know, uh, and maybe Rufus, you got into this a bit, but do you think there's something else going on behind the scenes here that we don't see? Um, the U.S. put out its public statement about its its desire for a candidate with a, a significant trade experience. But how do these backroom discussions often go? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of truth to what Wendy's saying that this the, the Koreans are in a difficult spot and and that Lighthizer has more emphasized their support for uh, for you rather than their statement that they would block Ngozi. But apparently Ambassador Shea in the uh, meeting explained some of the reasons for their um, their objections and for their will willingness to support consensus, whether those are the actual reasons or the publicly stated reasons. One was they said that the actual process itself had been deficient because there wasn't a procedure for people to indicate uh, negative consensus uh, before the last round. And this is sort of being viewed very, very um, skeptically by people who heard it, that uh, that seemed to be disingenuous because they had not made those complaints during the process itself. Um, and the and second- And other countries come in and they actually supported the process and disagreed with the US statement on yes, it? Yes, yeah, that's that's what the reporting is. And you know, this I'm, I'm basing this all on these news reports, but the other part of it is that, you know, they obviously had indicated that uh, that, that you know, the WTO needed somebody with more trade experience, with more practical, um, you know, on the ground knowledge of trade and trade negotiations, and the Negozi lacked that. Let me, uh, so let me follow up on that. Well, those though. are stated reasons. Is, is that a is that a skill set that you think is necessary for a director general? I, I mean, you know, can one of the best director generals in the history of the GATT WTO system was Peter Sutherland, who, who was a competition commissioner. Uh, most DGs have had quite a bit of background in trade. Um, you know, some of them have been successful. Some of them have been pretty, pretty unsuccessful. So, you know, it's, it's no guarantee one way or the other. Um, I think largely depends on the individual and the circumstances that the individual finds himself in. But I, just quickly commenting back on, on Wendy, you know, I think now that will be a large part of the equation is how much is, is what Lighthizer is doing based on real objections to Negosi, or is it more kind of the same approach he's had towards the appellate body, which is, um, you know, I'm not in a real hurry to get this resolved because we don't really um, mind the WTO being dysfunctional for the time being. That's the suspicion of a lot of the membership. Um, and that's probably why they want to wait to see further how the U.S. reacts to, you know, whatever pressure would get mounted. 
Would it be, and, and you know, Wendy, you've been at USTR during transitions in the past between administrations. Um, hypothetically, I mean, there's two scenarios that happen next week, you know, assuming we have a result, President Trump's reelected, and then we have a set of circumstances and the groundwork's already been laid for the U.S. position on, on this and, and how that'll play out is anybody's guess at this point, I guess. But if Biden were to win the election, is there, are there back channels that, you know, that the, that the WTO may go to, to Biden's people to find out it, what their feelings would be about an Ngozi candidacy? And would that maybe trigger some of the actions about seeking a vote and such, or pushing this off till January? Well, again, I don't even think they would need to make those um, informal contacts. I mean, in my view, if, if Biden does win, then I think the, 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 impetus for for delaying this decision just becomes you know very strong and so um you know we can talk later about what are the options going forward but i think in my mind just trying to get over the hump of our election let's see how things come out and then then um you know the troika and others can decide whether um you know what should happen and whether this meeting on november 9th should even be called or, or what the outcome should be. Just to, Ian, just to add something, you know, Rufus mentioned growing suspicion about a lot of members about the US position and you mentioned the appellate body. Let's also remember just a few months ago, the US came in unpredictably on the acting director general debate, mm -hmm. remember? It looked like everyone was coalescing against the EU deputy director general to be acting and the U.S. came in and said, no, we want the U.S., um, you know, Alan Wolf to be the acting director general. So there, there is a pattern here. And I think this is just, le you know, creating a lot of kind of um, concern and angst and frankly, um, kind of a, a, a growing dissatisfaction and disappointment with the United States in the WTO now under Ambassador Lighthizer's leadership. And let me just make a few comments. Please. Um, first, in terms of the uh, first uh, argument that uh, uh, Ambassador Shea apparently made uh, yesterday at the uh, at the informal HIV meeting, uh, of course, the procedures that um, the Troika have been following uh, that were agreed to in 2002 and which were used in 2005 and again in 2013 with success specifically prohibit countries from raising uh, negative preferences. Uh, so the concept that the process is flawed because you can't raise negative preferences ignores exactly what the revised procedures in 2002 were designed to do, which was to get away from countries talking about people they didn't like and having them focus on people that they did like uh, it, with the expectation that, uh, that everyone would accept the outcome of the process, which obviously hasn't happened. In terms of the substantive issues, uh, in looking at the comments that were made by both um, the Nigerian and the, uh, uh, and the Korean during, not only during the process in Geneva, but uh, in uh, other sessions that they had, uh, either here uh, with WIDA or, or with other groups, uh, it seemed to me that uh, if I were in Lighthizer's shoes, I could see significant concerns that while everybody talked about all of the issues and made their comments in ways that were intended not to ruffle any feathers of the majors, uh, it, it would not be unreasonable to say uh, that uh, Dr. Ngozi was much more focused on the development aspects and how to move the development issues forward and if you're the United States under the Trump administration, where, you're, where you believe that there's really fundamental reform that's needed, that's not really oriented on the development side, uh, that may have been a concern that, uh, that, 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 was, uh, uh, that, that that would prove unacceptable uh, in, the, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next number of years. Uh, you know, finally, in terms of delay, while I could understand the rest of the membership, particularly if Rufus's comment that despite the specific provision and the procedures that they could go to a vote where they can't get consensus, if, if that doesn't mean what it says, but rather they'd have to 
look at other articles to see what the, how to how to agree to vote. I, I always read the uh, Article 20 as saying basically uh, it would be up to the director, uh, up to the chair of the general council to decide if they went to a vote, uh, regardless of the opposition, because it's exactly to get over the prevention of consensus that you would get there. But there is a there is a there is a significant issue about delay, right? Uh, originally, I believe they were hoping to be able to do the general council today, so that they could get a new director general in place and give them the most time, so that they could in fact have a meaningful uh, ministerial conference uh, in Kazakhstan next June. Uh, obviously, if you push this out uh, to uh, to June, and, and it, will, it may very well be longer than that because USTR. Uh, will likely be uh, riding with vacancies and without a focus from the Biden administration if it's a new administration uh, beyond that. You're basically saying that the WTO is not going to reach uh, a significant program uh, for the Kazakhstan ministerial, which for lots of countries would be viewed as a, uh, as a major loss. So... Uh... Yeah, and that's all. And of course, that's already been put off from because of COVID for since since this past summer. Um, all right. So so before we wrap up, um, I guess we you know I think we have I think we've we've kind of heard a general consensus amongst you three that if Biden wins, you know there may be one set of ways that this would go forward. There may be a delay or um, until January until they can come in and and. Uh, approved formally, or maybe there'll be some informal consultations that would take place. But if, you know, the status quo is in place, you know, what do we, where do we go from here? Or is it really just completely uncharted territory and everybody's sort of trying to figure things out uh, on the fly? So, you know, I, I think obviously it is sort of uncharted territory. I mean, we, we've had deadlocks over the leadership of the WTO before, you know, the fight between Subichai and, uh, and Moore dragged on for nearly a year. And mm -hmm. there was an acting head of secretariat who wasn't even a deputy director general. It was one of the division directors. So you, you should know that, you know, in that sense, we're not in uncharted territory. Okay. The WTO has been without a director general before. Just to go back to Terry's point, I mean, obviously people want to see the um, WTO moving forward with an agenda, but they also know that if there's an election that changes power in the U.S. and I, I, you know, I think this is more significant than a change of power in many other systems because it, in the U.S., this kind of a change could portend a complete 180 degree shift in attitudes towards multilateralism, towards international organizations. You know, away from uh, somebody who's uh, taken a very dim view of them and has actually pulled out of the WHO and threatened to pull out of the WTO versus someone who has indicated, you know, that the U.S. wants to get back into these and be more of a leader. So, you know, that, that's, that's a big shift, much bigger than it would be if this were just a change of the commission in the, in the European Union, for example, because there's much more continuity in terms of their support of, of international organizations and the centrality of those organizations to their policies. So, you know, a lot of countries don't understand how fundamental this is in the U.S. I think it's more important to, to know where the U.S. is going than it is to be able to say, okay, now we've got somebody in place so we can start planning for um, Kazakhstan because there's not going to be much to plan for Kazakhstan unless there is full engagement of the major members in that process. And, you know, there probably can't be full engagement by the U.S. until January if, if Biden is elected. If Trump is reelected, you know, I think they'll move pretty hastily towards trying to see if they can overcome these differences and get a deal with the U.S. over, over the next director general because people will want the WTO to move forward. But I, I think in this scenario of a Biden election, you know, we'll have to see how Bob Lighthizer behaves. But if he continues to say he's going to block until he walks out the door on January 20th, I think there'll be a strong temptation of the membership to, to wait that out and, and to, to let it be resolved when Biden comes in. Query whether once Biden comes in, will he simply say, yes, I agree to negotiate or will 
there be further bargaining over who gets selected and what the trade-offs are and that sort of thing. If I can just Please. add, I think, I think like forcing a vote on this issue, it, it, the implications of that are so much broader than just the DG race, right? Because that almost means that the consensus principle is out the window. And what does that mean for every other issue? Yeah. Um, and you know what are the implications for other negotiations, and frankly, even for the appellate body, for yeah. example. So, it's like ending the filibuster in the Senate. <laughs> Something that you know what, has a reaction, right? <laughs> we could be seeing a whole lot of uh, upturn, uh, uh, turning over the tables in our way of doing things in the months and years to come. Yeah. Um, I heard any that, final yeah. words before we wrap this up, Terry? Yeah, I, I heard from some friends that uh, a number of countries in Geneva had gotten together uh, after uh, what happened at the heads of delegation meeting, uh, and we're trying to figure out what the road forward uh, is, and that included not only possibility of waiting to see what the outcome of the, I mean, they're going to have to wait since the, uh, since the general council meeting is not till the 9th, so they should know. But also that, uh, you know, there, there were questions by at least some members as to whether or not uh, you might you might not give the post to either of the uh, of the two, but rather go to a third candidate who had gotten knocked out. Uh, one of the other Africans, presumably Amina, uh, Ambassador Amina, if, uh, if uh, Mohammed, if she if she was a nurse. I don't see that happening myself, but I thought it was interesting that you had groups of countries getting together. And trying to figure out what the uh, what the next steps would be, uh, depending on which way the election in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. goes. Interesting. Well, more 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 food for thought, um, and for the the trade speculating, uh, the trade community speculation to continue. Um, well, thank you all very much. Um, we, we I reached out to you guys yesterday to try to do this quickly, and and I'm really grateful to. Uh, uh, the three of you for, for joining us uh, so quickly today. Apologies, everyone, for my Zoom link going down and having to jump back on. Um, but thank you for carrying on without me. Uh, really grateful to all of you. Look forward to following up with you again in the, in the days and weeks to come. Take care of yourself, everybody. Um, be safe. Wear a mask.